<clears throat> Since the attack on the flotilla, the Freedom Flotilla, uh, which was um, on May 31st of last year, since that bloody attack when nine activists were killed, um, the culture of boycott really took off. I mean, if there is any one threshold that we can point to historically after five years, historians would say that was the moment when culture of boycott really took off. It was May 31st, 2010, the flotilla attack. After the flotilla attack, and for you know some peculiar reason, suddenly all these bands and all these cultural figures became very supportive of BDS. So we had world best selling authors, Henning Mankell, Ian Banks, uh, and of course Alice Walker at that period too. Um, then the Pixies and Costello and Gil Scott Heron boycotted, and then Meg Ryan and Dustin Hoffman, and so on and so forth. It, it really started snowballing since May 31st until Roger Waters of uh, uh, Pink Floyd came out just recently, March, I think of this year, in The Guardian, and supported BDS openly. And he was the first big mega star to support BDS uh, openly. But we also had Mike Lee, the Jewish, British, very famous filmmaker uh, and writer, boycotting a festival in, in Tel Aviv, a conference in Tel Aviv, and also coming out and saying, I was duped by Zionism. He was a Zionist all his life. And he said, I was duped by Zionism. They, they made us uh, shut our eyes to the sufferings of the Palestinian people and to make everything justifiable but by what Jews had undergone in Europe. And for someone like Mike Lee to say that, not your typical anti-Zionist lefty Jew, a very establishment Zionist Jewish huge cultural figure in Britain. It was very effective to the British public, especially the Jewish public in Britain. Talking about Jews and Jewish publics, after the flotilla attack, many Jewish persons and groups uh, got off their fence. I mean, they were sitting on the fence for way too long, saying, oh, we cannot take sides. Yes, we don't like the occupation, but Israel is, uh, needs our protection and our void. They came off the fence. I mean, th they could, that was untenable to continue playing that immoral position, in my hypocritical immoral position, of saying, oh, I'm against the occupation, but I love Israel. Well, what does that mean? I really, we, Palestinians cannot understand that. I'm against the occupation, but I love Israel. What the hell do you love about Israel today? I mean, how can anyone with any moral consistency love Israel? They, they, they either come out and say, we're Zionists, and we couldn't care less about Palestinian rights. You know, you're, you're subhuman, and we couldn't care less about your, your sufferings and, and your tragedy, and what Israel is committing against you. We care first and foremost about protecting Israeli apartheid. Because those who say we want to protect Israel as a Jewish state, what are they saying? What country has a right to have an exclusionary identity? Jewish state, Christian state, a white state, Muslim state, whatever state that excludes others on the basis of identity is a racist state by definition. And anyone defending that is a racist. Pure and simple. There is no other justification for defending Israel as a Jewish state except racism. Just like anyone who defends any exclusionary state, Hindu, Muslim, whatever it, it may be. <clears throat> and again, imagine the equivalent in the US for the majority to come out and say, well, we want the US, and there are, you have your fair share of nuts in the US that are saying this, mm -hmm. we need the US to be a Christian state, really, and the Bible to be our constitution. And others, you know, they can continue to live here, but they can't get total rights. I mean, they can't run for president. They can't be dominant and conquer. It really has to be a Christian state. Those others are really destroying our cultural fabric, our identity. This land was built by those white, wonderful European pioneers who came and you know discovered that, and so on and so forth, this whole mythology. Why wouldn't they say that? I mean, they're defending that in Israel. Why wouldn't they say, those, those Christian fundamentalists, why wouldn't they say that in the US as well? But the, the, the strange thing is not the nutty Christian fundamentalists, it's the Jewish Zionists, who are the hypocrites. Those fundamentalists are not hypocrites. I mean, they're very consistent. They're waiting for the Messiah, and then in the meanwhile, you know, let's move every, every Jew to Israel so that when the Messiah comes, they all die. They're very open about their agenda. They either convert to Christianity or they die. So the best way to kill them all is get them all to Israel. 
<coughs> so spend the, I mean, there's openly anti-Semitic, as, as anti-Semitic as it gets. And they're Israel's best friend in the US, <laughs> biggest friend in the US as well. I mean, APAC is much smaller than the Christian Zionist uh, lobby in terms of numbers, not influence, but numbers. But it's the, the, the Jewish Zionists who are the true hypocrites who still say, we defend civil rights in the US, we want equal rights in the US, but in Israel, it's we want, we love apartheid in the US, in, in Israel. We love apartheid. We want to protect Israel as an apartheid state. I.F. Stone, the famous Jewish American writer, as far back as 1968, if I'm not mistaken, was the first, as far as I know, who raised this hypocrisy, who said American Jews are at the forefront of the civil rights movements calling for equal rights together with blacks at the time. But in Israel, they're defending uh, 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 laws that prevent mixed marriages. They're defending the most racist reality in Israel. Uh, and this is sheer hypocrisy. And this hypocrisy continues today. But why are we using this term apartheid to describe Israel? I mean, um, some people will jump and say, well, Israel is so different than South Africa as I, myself, and many, many others have acknowledged. So why are we saying Israel is an apartheid state? Well, apartheid has nothing to do with South Africa. There is no monopoly on the term apartheid in South Africa. It's a universal crime that existed in South Africa, but it was defined by UN conventions. There's the Convention for the Suppression and Punishment of the Crime of Apartheid that was passed by the General Assembly, UN General Assembly, in 1973 and went into effect in 1976. It defines the crime of apartheid. More recently, the 2002 Rome Statute for the International Criminal Court, the ICC, defined apartheid in very clear terms as a system of institutionalized, legalized oppression by one racial group to another. So it has nothing to do with South Africa. You don't have to prove identity or, or closeness to South Africa to show that any state is an apartheid state. So the US, was an apartheid state. The southern states were, apart, were, were actually committing the crime of apartheid. But we just did not have the term then to call it apartheid. When they had different laws applying to whites and non-whites, coloreds, blacks, and so on, that was apartheid because it wasn't racism. It was institutionalized, legalized racial discrimination. Racism exists today everywhere, in democratic countries, so-called democratic countries, and everywhere else. So Israel is not unique in that sense, but we're not talking about racism, we're talking about institutionalized, legalized racial discrimination. And that's what Israel has. And many people don't know that even the US State Department issues an annual human rights report, as some of you may know, and every single year, this report condemns Israel, legal, institutional, societal discrimination against its Arab minority. Every single year, Which they call department? it the U.S. State Department, the State Department in their human rights report issues. So if you Google that, legal, societal, institutional discrimination, U.S. State Department, you'll find it. It's against Israel every single year. So even the U.S. State Department indirectly is admitting that Israel is an apartheid state. But who's the U.S. to judge human rights? That's another story. But, but even the U.S. State Department says that. Uh, because of all this, we felt that boycotts, divestments, and sanctions were the most effective, nonviolent, peaceful means of resisting Israeli occupation, colonization, and apartheid, as well as solidarity, especially for solidarity movements. Today, solidarity groups that are not doing BDS are not doing solidarity. At least not solidarity with the Palestinians. Solidarity with some version of Israeli apartheid, solidarity with themselves, solidarity with Mars, or dolphins, but not with us. Today, those who are not doing BDS are not doing solidarity with Palestine. Simple. I mean, they could be doing other things, that's fine, but those who still today refuse to adopt BDS are not doing solidarity with us. They don't have to endorse BDS yet, but to accept that we have three basic rights under international law and to do boycott, divestment, sanctions tactics, to adopt those tactics, even if they have not yet endorsed BDS as a whole. That's okay, as long as they're doing BDS and accepting the basic uh, rights-based approach of the BDS movement. Um, we, another aspect of the BDS movement that's not often talked about, and, and you won't hear much about it in the mainstream media, is the Israeli 
component of the BDS movement, our Israeli partners. Um, we have boycott from within, which was established after the massacre in Gaza, 2009. The Coalition of Women for Peace. Uh, you've met, you've met them. No, okay, so you know about who profits, whoprofits.org, which is an excellent resource uh, for the BDS movement's activists everywhere in the world, uh, because it has every single company or most of them that are profiting from Israeli occupation. That doesn't cover all the companies that are complicit in Israeli crimes because Israel is not just about occupation, but that's a good chunk of it. That's a good chunk of it and it's a good start to start with companies involved in the occupation and it's the easiest target because it's, it's very clear. Uh, uh, the complicity in violating international law is very clear in, in that sense. So we have Israeli partners um, who have helped tremendously despite their small numbers in advancing the BDS movement. In many of our um, uh, appeals to artists, to music groups, it's not just Adala New York, it's not just our partners in London, it's also our, our partners in Tel Aviv who, who write to those artists and help us to convince them not to come to Israel, boycott apartheid Israel. And coming from a group of Jewish Israelis, it's very convincing to some artists who do not want to be called anti-Semitic, who are so scared of being called anti-Semitic, and to have that kind of um, support coming from Israel for such a call, Palestinian call, helps a lot to convince them that it has nothing to do with anti-Semitism. It has to do with taking a moral stand against Israel's oppression, colonial and racist oppression, and that's it. Uh, as we've always said, the identity of the majority in Israel, being Jewish or not, is completely and totally irrelevant to us. We couldn't care less about the identity of our oppressors. So long as they're oppressing us, we'll continue to resist them. They could be Muslim or Hindu or Christian, it wouldn't matter, or atheist, it wouldn't matter. The fact that they're oppressing us is the only relevant issue, and we shall continue to resist until we end their oppression and attain our rights under international law.